Ken, as a yeah. physicist trying to understand consciousness, you think a lot about the human brain, obviously. Uh, what are some of the basic principles that you're using about the brain and neuroscience that might give you some real deep insights about how to understand consciousness? Yeah, my favorite one is one put forward by Ernst Mach, who was a physicist philosopher who influenced Albert Einstein yeah, very much yeah. in his formulation of theory of relativity. Uh, the so-called Mach's principle states that when an individual entity has a property, that property is determined by its relationship to other individual entities in the universe. For example, uh, when you talk about a mass, you know, when it, the mass of a particle is not determined by it alone, mm. the mass of a particle is determined by its relationship to all other particles in the universe. And so every particle, take gravity as an example, the effect of gravity yeah. is related to every particle in the universe exactly. in some small way because they all affect the geometry of space time and all of that. So it all affects, every particle affects every other particle. Yes, in some that's small. the idea. Mm -hmm. So it's a very relational view of the world, right? right, right. And uh, I think some principle can be applied to how a conscious perception arises in the brain. Mm. If you take a neuron, if you remove it from the brain mm. and put it on a dish, yeah, yeah. stimulate it, yeah. then it doesn't have consciousness. The reason why a neuron uh, have some spe specific uh, uh, role in consciousness is because it has all these rich relationships between other neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. So. We must ask really how we can you know, identify the special role played by a neuron by looking at all these complex network structure within the brain. Mm -hmm. So I think Mach's principle can be applied to how consciousness arises from human brain activities in a very nice way. Okay, well certainly uh, to generate consciousness from the physical brain is a challenge. Yeah. Some would say it's impossible, others would say we've just begun the process. Uh, but certainly, if it's going to work, it will require some principles that go beyond the current physical kinds of principles that we see in, in the brain. Yeah. And so when you're saying that every neuron to be part of a conscious system has to relate to other neurons, uh, do you mean only in the electrical activity between them and the so-called action potential? Or are there other ways, the chemical environment, some people talk about resonances uh, uh, across the whole neuron. How, how deep does your, uh, th does Mach's principle for neurons uh, go? Robert, so that's the greatest enigma about consciousness, isn't it? And it's apparent that consciousness is non-local because, you know, consciousness is unified. And my phenomenal experience is composed of all these different bits coded by different neurons in my brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is non-local, you know, it's distributed within my skull. Mm. So when you are dealing with a non-local phenomenon, uh, for example, quantum mechanics comes into mind mm. because quantum mechanics is fundamentally non-local. Mm. So when we talk about the physical processes, especially as regards the mutual relationships between physical processes in the brain, we may have to go beyond classical mechanics. We may have to resort to mm. quantum mechanics. Mm. Who knows? Mm. Uh, after all, quantum mechanics is the most fundamental natural law that mm. we know. Mm. Mm. So, you know, it's an open question yet. So if it's an open question on quantum mechanics, um, that could be another mechanism that n creates a neuronal uh, uh, interactions be between um, huge numbers of neurons or, or a, a way to have neurons in some kind of superposition? Or how, how, how do you mean? Well, uh, one thing is that we haven't understood quantum mechanics in its full potentiality. In its simple potentiality. Yeah, yeah, because I think it was Richard Feynman who said, uh, yeah. you know, if you understand quantum mechanics, you haven't understand right, right. You have quantum just, mechanics. If you say yeah. you understand quantum mechanics, yeah. you've, proven, exactly. you've proven that you don't understand. Yeah, that. exactly. So, so quantum mechanics uh, has probably a lot of more potentials in it, you know, manifestations mm -hmm. in the world. So we really don't know what is, its role is uh, in generating consciousness. So I think it's fair to say, to admit, uh, you know, uh, I think it's fair to admit that uh, quantum mechanics might have something to do with consciousness. 
there are some people who, who are really, really strong-minded and who say, you know, it's, you know, as error of scale and, you know, uh, brain is a macroscopic uh, uh, phenomenon, so you cannot really apply quantum mechanics to, you know, brain functions. That's fine. That's one way of reasoning. But I don't think that's very fair. It's not fair to, you know, kind of, uh, preclude this possibility that quantum mechanics have something to do with mm. uh, consciousness. Mm. I think there's a certain uh, possibility there. So how do you see brain networks versus uh, individual neurons uh, in the process of consciousness? Well, I think uh, the network needs every neuron to function. But on the other hand, every neuron needs the network to, you know, pursue its proper role in the cognition and the consciousness. So it's a mutually dependent relationship. Uh, so it's kind of a bootstrapping process, isn't it? It's, you know, each neuron contributes to the cis network and network assigns some role to individual neurons. So we really need to understand this bootstrapping process, how the system builds itself from elements and how each element uh, is uh, uh, obtains some functionality through this networking. Now we know there's a lot of redundancy because yeah. neurons can be yeah, insulted exactly. and things can change and, and there's, a, there's redundancy and changing. We know if there's brain injury uh, it, over a period of months or years, uh, uh, functions can migrate in the brain and neurons can be recruited into totally different functions. Exactly. This is one of the most fascinating story. Uh, you know, you know, my, uh, old Cambridge boss, uh, Professor Horace Barrow, who is actually a grand, great grandson of Charles Darwin, I think. Uh, uh -huh. he, he always talked about reducing redundancy, how it is important uh -huh. to reduce redundancy uh -huh. in the information processing in the brain. Uh -huh. And I think have, there are some studies which show that the information bandwidth of Consciousness is very narrow. It's uh, at the most uh, something like uh, I, I think a little more than hundred bits per second. Oh. So you know, so you do need to reduce redundancy unless you you know if you process something consciously because there's not that much information bandwidth in consciousness. Mm. So reduction of redundancy is one of the fundamental principles that we need when understanding cognition and consciousness in general. But doesn't that make consciousness even more mysterious that you can generate with such a, a narrow bandwidth? It is, uh, but you know, many research show that you are not uh, aware of great you know, yeah, changes yeah, yeah. Right, in the environment, right, like right. change brightness and so on. Right, right. So... Because I'm focusing on you and your words, I, things in the background. Or, you yeah, know, yeah I'm, exactly. I'm around, yeah. So it is a fact that uh, consciousness has only a very narrow bandwidth. Yeah. But at the same time, we feel that it is so massively parallel. <laughs> All these rich phenomenology and so on. So there's this enigma, you know. Uh, I think and the brain does a very good, good job uh, in reducing consciousness. I mean, the brain has a, a big, does, the brain is doing a very good job in reducing redundancy. But uh, on the other hand, consciousness seems so rich in phenomenology. So there's a great enigma here, mm -hmm. great contradiction.